Welcome everybody to chapter three of Bill Haywood's book. That is the autobiography of Big Bill Haywood. Um, this chapter is called Homestead and Hard Times. The old fort was typical of many of its kind to be found throughout the West at that time. It was built in a hollow square around the barbed wire fence. The barns and stables were on the right, while on the left was a big granary, which was set up off of the ground on piles. On top of each pile, before the sills were laid, a tin pan, uh, before the sills were laid, a tin pan had been placed upside down to prevent rats or mice from getting in. The soldiers' barracks were on one side of the parade ground, the officer's house on the other. These were small but neat, well-built dwellings of lumber. The officers used to see that they were kept warm in winter, as they had great ricks of mahogany wood, which cost them 40 to $60 a cord, and which had to be brought on mule back for long distances on mountain trails. We took up our abode in what had been the captain's house. Our furniture was scanty. There were neither blinds nor curtains at the windows, nor a carpet on the floor. A big bed, chairs, and a table besides our cooking outfit was the extent of our household goods. My wife spent her time making baby clothes. She startled me one morning sooner than we had expected by saying that she was suffering from labor pains. We were alone. We had planned to get Mrs. Vance, who was acting as a midwife for her neighbors and who lived 10 miles away. My wife said that she did not think the baby would come during the time it would take me to drive over and get the old woman. So I hitched up and started at breakneck speed for help. When I got to the Vance farm, the old lady put on her hat and coat and got in the wagon. I was not two hours in making the 20 miles. Just ahead of us, my wife's father and mother pulled in from Willow Creek. Mrs. Vance hurried into the house while I drove the team back to the barn and left them for the old man to unhitch. I went to the house on a run where I found that my wife's mother had fainted when she heard her daughter's groans and realized what was about to happen. There she lay on the floor, and as Mrs. Vance came into the room, she too fell down in a faint. I went and got a dipper of water and threw it hastily in their faces and left them where they fell. Now I have confronted many desperate situations, but nothing so serious as this, and none that required the same nerve and coolness on my part. I do not know what had, or I did not know what had to be done, and I thought my wife was going to die. She seemed to be in such terrible pain. I said some words of encouragement to her as she lay moaning with the increasing pangs, and I grabbed the doctor book and hurriedly read all that I could find on childbirth. A baby girl was born. I had tied and cut the navel cord when Mrs. Vance came to her senses. I was too busy to notice her until just as I was cleaning up the afterbirth, my mother-in-law also came out of her faint. At last, they were calm enough to go and heat some water and wash my wife and the baby, who was as bright and healthy as though she had expert attention at her birth instead of only the unskilled help of her poor father. My wife came through safely. All through the confusion caused by the old lady's unaccountable behavior, she had kept cooler than any of us. While she was still in bed, Old Jim's horse had a pirate uh, Indian who would come every morning and flatten his nose against the window pane and ask, how's your wife and baby? He showed the greatest interest in the progress of the baby. The accusation of cruelty is only due to prejudice against the Indians. I have known many Indians, and I have found them more friendly and more loyal to their friends than many other people. In the spring, I joined a government surveying corps to plot that part of the country around Black Rock and Quinn River Sink. Moran, the server, surveyor, had taken the precaution to get his men in good shape for the work. The first month, we were busy preparing stakes, cutting them the right length, sharpening them, and running preliminary lines. In the month of April, we did 900 miles of measured work, an average of 30 miles a day, Sundays included. After we were through surveying, I went to Paradise Valley, where I worked during the haying for the Reese brothers. Aaron Reese was a russet-faced, heavy-set Welshman with a red beard. It was a fine bunch of men on his ranch who had a great store of good stories to enliven spare moments. The way they broke horses to harness on this ranch gave me all the thrill of a Ben-Hur chariot race. We would hitch a gentle, well-broken horse on the offside of a mowing machine, having lifted the sickle bar and tied it securely. While the wild horse was being hitched beside the other, the driver would seat and brace himself. The men holding the wild horse would let go. With a desperate plunge to free himself from the contraptions that were all new in his life, the broncho would jump and rear at the rattle and clatter of the machine behind him. There was nothing to do but let the horses run. The gentle horse would crowd when the rein was pulled and made the wild one uh, circle in wide rings. After a short time, they were driven back and unhitched. After two or three exercises of this kind, we would put the colt to regular work cutting grass. I was with the threshing outfit that season after the haying was done. There were a lot of small farmers who had grain to thresh, and we had a good crew of men with our machine and put through more grain than I had ever been threshed in that valley before. The boss of the outfit wanted to pay 25 cents a day less than the previous season. 
So every man on the job quit, leaving the threshing machine standing alone in the field. Now up to this time, I had never drunk much and had gambled but little. The day we quit the threshing machine, everybody went to town. A dice game was running in Gil and Ann's saloon. I began to play and before the night was over, I had won everything but the key on the front door. Gil and Ann borrowed some money and won back from me most of his property, but the money I had won, I sent home. From Paradise Valley, I went to Eagle Creek and was working in the Caledonia mine. When my brother-in-law got word to me that the McDermott reservation had been thrown open to entry, that is, people could settle upon it, taking as much as 160 acres of land. The law required that the settler should build a house and till the land for five years, after which it would belong to him. This is what was called homesteading. It was late at night when I got this word, but I got out of bed and started to Fort McDermott on horseback. There were not more than five or 600 acres of the Fort land, and this is where we located our homesteads. There were two of us, my father-in-law and myself, so there would not be room for any more settlers except on the government hay reservation in the bottomland, where my brother-in-law Jim took up his homestead. We knew there was but little chance of the word getting out about the land being open to entry, but we lost no time in getting there first as these farms were worth striving for. I can remember the thought about having a home of my own that ran through my head as we loped along. We got to McDermott early in the morning and after breakfast it once started to run our lines, that is to mark the boundaries. My farm was just below the old army post where the valley was wildest. We built foundations on the three places and I went to Winnemucca for lumber out of which I built a one room house with a lean to kitchen. This room I lined with burlap and whitewashed it. It made a fine wall and ceiling as tight as a drum. I moved my wife and baby down into our new house. Life began to take on a new aspect. Every tap of work I did, building fences, digging ditches, was for ourselves. Now it was a question of where to build the barn, where the chicken coop should be, where the corral, and what kind of trees to set out. It was very fine land. The loam was deep and would grow anything. There were so many things we needed that money was an immediate, necess money was an immediate necessity. I left home for Tuscarora, a mining camp some 125 miles different, distant. The first night I stopped at Thompson's Mill at Willow Creek. There were four other men gathered there that night. The place had been abandoned, but the stove and cooking utensils were still there. All of us had some grub with us and we got supper ready consisting of bacon, flapjacks and coffee. While we sat at the table eating, someone remarked that we were a strange group. We looked at him inquiringly and he said, well, every man here has lost an eye. Sure enough, this was true. We were the only one-eyed men in the county and we were all together that night. The next morning we started out going down the canyon. I went across the summit to Paradise Valley. Here I met Billy Townsend, a farmer who had gone to Tuscarora with a load of produce. He agreed to take me with him and I stopped that night on this farm. Next morning we started out with a six horse team and two wagons. We went through Squaw Valley and Soldier Summit where we spread our blankets on the ground. The next morning we were covered with a blanket of snow and the entire country as far as we could see was white. When we got to Tuscarora, Townsend said, well, I've got to get out of here as soon as I can sell out. I haven't a minute to lose or I'll be snowed in. I think I can dispose of the grain and other stuff quick, but I don't want to be bothered with these chickens. I'll be glad to get 50 cents a piece for them. You think you could sell them? He had two crates full of chickens. I said I'd try and did sell them with some gain to myself, which came in handy before I got to work. The next morning, I started rustling at the mine for a job and finally took a lease on a slip stope in the Navajo mine, which was on the slope of Mount Blitzen. In cleaning up the lease, we had to lower the ore by means of rope to the tunnel that ran to the main shaft, there to be hoisted to the surface. This meant handling the sacks several times. When we got it on top, we carried it to a jig to wash the screenings. The bulk of the ore we sent directly to the sampler and it was paid for by the mining company. The rest of the ore we sent after we had worked it through the jig, which was a contrivance worked by hand in which the values settled in the bottom while the waste was washed off at the top. Around the shaft house were mountain high piles of sagebrush, as at this time they fired the boilers with those Lilliputton oaks. The brush was wet down before it was pitched into the firebox. Later, I worked at the Commonwealth Mine. In the stope where I was working, among other men, was one Joy Pollard, whose name I mentioned because of the fact that many years afterward, I met him again in Cripple Creek, Colorado, and he was one of the delegates to the initial convention of the industrial workers of the world in Chicago. Tuscarora was an interesting old camp. There were mines right in the center of town, and there were no company boarding houses or company stores. The miners either lived at home, boarded in restaurants, or lived with private families. The saloons were typical of a mining camp and were well patronized. Usually a long bar ran the length of one side with two or three tables in the front and a card room in the rear. Faro and poker were the favorite games. I was standing at the bar in Lewis Angle's saloon one night when the barkeep said, Bill, take a look at that group at the Faro table. There were eight men and one woman, 
or one woman. Every one of them had killed from one to six men. The woman, Molly Forche, had killed her paramour, who had tried and had been tried and sentenced to life imprisonment in the state penitentiary. After about two years in prison, she revealed the fact that she was to become a mother. To quiet the scandal involving the warden, the governor had pardoned her. A teamster who was hauling freight on the road from Tuscarora to Elko could be seen knocking around the saloons, gambling and smoking, but never indulging in drink. Got married, but the wife soon got a divorce. Later, the teamster put on dresses, uh, got married again, this time to a man, and raised a large family. They called her the Tuscarora What Is It? She had donned men's clothing so that she could make more money than was paid for women's work. Drinking, gambling, and dancing were not, only, or were not our only amusements. We had a lyceum club, study and debating class, which gave the young people the opportunity to learn something of history, literature, and so forth. Tom Minor was working on the Pea Bench Ranch near Tuscarora. He came to town one day and we decided to get home on a visit. Tom, of course, had his own outfit. I got a horse and saddle in the morning we started out. He rode an outlaw bronco, which he called Cherokee Bill. We rode down Independence Creek to the Oihi River and stopped at a ranch for the night. Next morning, early, we started out with a few slices of bread and bacon. The first thing to do was swim the river. It was high and wide and the water was cold. The horse I was riding swam low. They were only his eyes, ears, and nose in sight. I got soaking wet to the waist. Tom's horse was a high swimmer and he got wet only about to the knees. The Oihi River into which Jack Creek emptied was a tributary to the Snake River, which wriggled its way through Idaho and Oregon to the Columbia River. Up these various streams, thousands of miles, to the very foot of Mount Blitzen came the salmon from the Pacific Ocean to spawn. As we climbed out of the Oyehee River, we could see the top of Buckskin Mountain, which was at the head of McDermott Creek. Tom pointed to it saying, it's a long ride and maybe a dry camp. For the want of canteens, we had filled two bottles full of water. As the sun got higher and the day warmer, we rolled the bottles up in our coats and tied them to our saddles. There was no road. The distant mountain ahead was our only means of direction. We were now in the Diamond A Desert. Such names as Pea Bench and Diamond A come from the branding marks used by the ranches in this part of the country. The ranches themselves are called after their brands. There was no growth on the desert except a low scattered browse, which sheep fed upon in winter when there was snow to slake their thirst. As the miles passed, the size of old Mount Buckskin increased in our vision. It was clear day and the mountain appeared to be nearer than it really was. Our horses began to fag along in the late afternoon. We had made no stop since the early morning. Our clothes had dried on us. Neither we nor the horses had a bite to eat. Our water was all gone except a little in the bottom of the bottles. We got down, stretched ourselves, and the horses nibbled at the brows. We ate a slice of bread and bacon and drank what, what, what water we had and then mounted and set out again. The sun had gone down. We were making slow progress when we heard the sharp chatter of a magpie. There's water, we both cried at once, but there was nothing in sight except barren desert. We turned a little to the right and made for the place the sound had come from. The horses became restless and broke into a lope. In less than a hundred yards, we came to a deep canyon with sheer precipitous walls. Far below us lay the green, fresh grass, the crystal stream and the willows that fringed it. As far as we could see, there seemed to be no break in the cl cliffs. We rode along the edge. The horses, we knew, were hungry and thirsty. There, under their very noses, were fresh water, green grass, and no way to reach it. What must a horse think under these circumstances? We came at last to a narrow gully running down into the canyon, very steep and filled with slide rock. We rode down with no other mishap than a bad scratch on my horse's left hind leg. We unsaddled, picketed Cherokee Bill, and turned Preacher loose. Had a long drink, ate a bit, and stretched out with our saddles for pillows, pulling our saddle blankets up over us when the night got cold. At break of day, we were on our way, riding up the canyon until we came to an easy place to get up to the flat above. To our right, across the flat, we saw the Haystack Mountains, a group of low hills rising sharply from the plain, so much alike that cowboys invariably got lost among them during the roundups. We got home early in the afternoon. The family was glad to see us, and I was delighted to be back with my wife and baby. But the happiness was marred by the condition of my wife, who was suffering from a renewed attack of what doctors had called rheumatism. When a girl, she had been thrown from a horse and her spine was injured. It affected her joints, which were badly swollen and gave her much pain, from which she suffered all her life. I decided as a last resort to take her to Kyle Springs, a distance of about 140 miles, loading our bedding, food, and camping outfit onto a spring wagon and leaving the baby with her grandmother. We started out with a splendid pair of Palomino horses, cream colored with white manes and tails. We made the hill the first day, the second day drove to Winnemucca and the next to Kyle Springs. 
The curative properties of these waters were known far and wide, but the place was now deserted, as the mines in that part of the country had been worked out. It was a house of four or five rooms on a barren, bleak spot near Cinnabar Mountain, Unionville, and the other old mining camps were in the mountains across the valley, eight or ten miles away. There were small farms and ranches here and there. We were alone for three weeks or a month, except during a few days when some Indians camped at the springs. My wife was practically helpless, unable at that time to walk, so that I had to carry her everywhere. She could not even dress herself. In the morning, I would get up and dress, feed the horses, clean up the stable, ride one horse, and leave the other to water. The only fresh water was up the canyon about a mile. Coming back, I would wash, cook, and carry a little breakfast to my wife and clean up the dishes. Then I would roll her in a blanket and carry her up to the springs. There I dug a hole in the mud and put her in, covering her up to the neck with the oozy warm mud. Having done up her long hair with a towel, I fastened another towel on two stakes stuck in the mud for a pillow. I stripped before beginning the mud bath, steaming and other processes we went through every day. From the mud hole, which was outside in the open air, I carried Nevada into the plunge, wrenched the mud off, and wrapped her in the blankets to carry her back to the house. In the afternoon, I would again carry her to the springs, this time to dip her in the alum baths, which were in a hole so small that I had to be careful not to scratch her on the rock. After this came another turn in the steam bath and a plunge. After we'd been at the springs nearly a month and had visited the different ranches nearby, I stood my wife on the scale one day when we were in Unionville and found she weighed only 88 pounds. This was a loss of 25 pounds or more from her usual weight. We concluded that, tr that the treatment at the springs was too severe and decided to go home where we tried snake oil, sage baths, and all of the other Indian remedies. At the fall rodeo of the cattle ranches, the northern, at the fall rodeo of the cattle ranches of Northern Nevada, there were some bad men among the cowpunchers, quick on the trigger and ready to shoot at the drop of a hat. Some of the best Bronco busters of the West and some who were experts with their riatas. The outfit was camped for two nights on the left bank of the Humboldt River, a few miles from the lively town of Winnemucca where the cowboys did much drinking, wild riding, and reckless shooting, which was nothing out of the ordinary. This was the scene of a tragic fight between two cowboys, one armed with a double-action six-shooter, the other with a riata. I'll give you the story as Walter Rice, one of the participants, told it to me when he came to McDermott. I was crossing the parade ground one day when I saw a vaquero coming down the road, easily discernible from the way he rode and from his outfit. He wore chaparreros, the leg guards of the cowboys, made of goat skin with the long hair outside. A sombrero was set on the back of his head and long tapaderos flapped in unison when the nodding head of his big, fine-looking, cream-colored horse. Before I recognized him, he called out, Hello, Bill. Touching his horse with the spurs, he rode up on a jump pulling his mount back onto his haunches just as he reached me. He put out his hand with a western, How? Good, I said. Get down and look at your saddle. Put up your horse and have a bite. He started back towards the barn. Well, I don't know whether I'm going to stay long. I got a story to tell you. Pulling out the makings, he rolled a cigarette. All right, I said, but wait till dinner. I guess you're hungry. Well, hungry is no name for it. I crossed the Diamond A Desert yesterday without a stop and rode from the other side of Buckskin Mountain this morning. Knowing the distance, I looked at him and remarked, you must have been in a big hurry. Yes. Yet I don't know but what I'm going the wrong way. You haven't heard anything? Not a thing. But let's eat. Then you can tell your beads. After dinner, we went out and sat on the grass. Rice said, well, I think I killed a man before I left camp. Surprised, I asked how. Give me a match. I'll tell you how it happened, he said. After wetting with his tongue the cigarette he had been rolling. I was riding up the P Bench Ranch with the rodeo. We camped just north of Stauffer's Field on the Humboldt and had the saddle horses in the field. The first night, some of the boys came back from town pretty drunk. I had rolled my bed down next to, to Mex Ricardo. I didn't pay much attention to him, took off my gun and slipped it between the blankets under my coat after I had rolled up for a pillow. Next morning when I got up, I straightened the blankets a little, rolled them up under the canvas, washed them went to breakfast. After breakfast, I went back for my gun. It was gone. None of the boys had seen anyone around my bed. I didn't think of Ricardo at the time, but I sure was mad. That gun was a beauty, pearl-handled, blue-barreled, 38 on a 45 frame. Kind of a keepsake that I hated to lose. Where I got it's another story. Nearly every other day, or nearly everyone was saddled up before I caught a wall-eyed pinto that I rode that day. We were moping along through the low hills between the river and the toll house when Tom Badawin, riding just behind me, sung out, Rice, I thought you'd never said you'd sell that gun. What for would I want to sell it, I said. I couldn't buy a better one. Ah, oh, he says, I thought you sold it to Ricardo. You just let him take it, huh? Hell no, I'm damned if I did, I told him. I'd like to see him right now. We got through early that afternoon. 
when we had parted out the beef steers and had done what little branding there was to do, the sun was still high. Everybody worked lively, guessed they wanted to get to town for it to be their last chance to clean up for quite a while. I met Ricardo with a chuck wagon and I said to him, what'd you do with my gun? He answered kind of sheepish like, I throwed it in the river. I told him he'd have to be a damn good diver because I was gonna make him go get it. He was kind of playing me for a jug belly, I guess. He said, don't get sore, I'll get it back to you in the morning and walked off with his plate, knife and fork. Pretty soon I saw him cinching his saddle and I knew he was going to town. He didn't show off much that night before the senoritas. I hadn't unsaddled Pinto yet. I went over and climbed on. My rope was coiled loosely over the horn. I started after him, caught up with him and told him I wanted my gun and wanted it damn quick. I wasn't expecting him to shoot. He had my gun inside the belt of his chaps. He pulled and plugged me right through the arm here. Pulling up his coat sleeve, right showed me, a rice showed me the left forearm bandaged with a bloody handkerchief and continued. When he shot, his horse started to pitch, but Ricardo fired again, just grazing my leg. That didn't hurt much, but my arm did. I knew I'd have to do something to do it quick. When his horse stopped bucking and he'd get me sure. So I grabbed my riata, held the coils on this arm, but couldn't do much. Swung my loop and tossed the string on him just as the bay colt he was riding quit jumping. I took my turns and started for camp. He struck the ground with a thump. I could feel that we were pulling up sagebrush, but I didn't stop till we got to the wagon. There was some excitement. One of the boys took my rope off. I coiled it up and asked the fellers who were looking at Max if he was dead. They couldn't tell. I said, guess I'll go for a doctor and get this fixed up while I'm in town. My arm was bleeding the stream. Well, let me tie that up before you start, said one of the boys, taking his bandana off his neck. He tied it tightly around my arm above the wound. Didn't take a minute. Guy Kendrick made the ride with me. Went after old Doc Henson, told him there was a man hurt in camp who'd got caught in a rope and dragged. He sent for a saddle horse and asked me, asked what was the matter with me. I guess I looked kind of pale. I showed him my arm and without asking what happened, he said, I'll dress that for you while we're waiting for the horse. Be sure to come back in the morning. Got to be careful of infection. Went out to our horses. I said, you go on. I'm going for to get a bottle of whiskey, but I didn't. I waited till they crossed the bridge and followed them. When we got close to camp, I rode out into the sagebrush and dropped the reins. I knew Pinto would stand. Dodging through the sagebrush, I got close enough to see what was going on. I could tell from the way Doc and the fellows was acting that Max was dead. I went back to where I left Pinto and thought things over for a few minutes. Should I go into town and give myself up? Next day the outfit would leave and I'd be alone and in jail. No telling how long I'd be there. I'd need a lot of money for a lawyer. So I piled onto old Pinto and waved my hat to the camp and although it was dark and hit the trail for the Pea Bench Ranch. I didn't make it till the next night. Woke Tom Miner and told him what had happened. I washed and fixed my arm a little, had something to eat, a few hours sleep. And early the next morning, Tom woke me. He had breakfast ready, a lunch fixed, and two horses saddled. He said, I'm going to the forks of the road with you. There he bid me goodbye. If you don't go back, that flag-tailed nag is yours. It's good for a long ride if you have to make it. I waited a few minutes, turned and rode down Jack Creek, swam the oil he on Bacon's ranch. You know the rest. Now I want to take care of my arm for a day or two and stay under cover. That day, we, uh, Bill's talking again. That day we rode across the valley to Washburn Canyon and fixed him up in a little deserted cabin there. Two days later, I went back. Rice was gone. A note written on the margin of the newspaper was on the table under a cup. It read, get my gun. I'll do as much for you. Um, it was a present from my sweetheart. Send it to her. I'll get it back when I go to Idaho. So I got his gun from Billy Higginson, one of the cowboys who'd picked it up where Ricardo dropped it when he was jerked from his horse. I sent it as requested to the address that he had, that he had given. It was a long time before Rice ventured to visit his old stamping ground. His sweetheart had received the gun, but no word from Rice. She thought that he had changed his mind and had sent back the present she had given him. After weary months of waiting, she gave the gun to another fellow. One day, Rice rode into his hometown. He had her picture in the conscience of his bridle. Tying his horse in front of a saloon, he walked in to look for old acquaintances. He was about to take a drink when a young fellow came and walked up to him and said, Stranger, you got to take them pictures off your bridle. What, said Rice? And then it occurred to him what had happened. You both began to shoot at the same time. Rice was killed with the present from his sweetheart. <sighs> Bill continues on. After we returned from Kyle Springs, I worked on my farm putting in head gates, cutting fence posts, and digging ditches. When the old mining fever would come back, I would go to the mountains and do some prospecting. I relocated the wild deer mine on Flat Creek and took two other claims over the ridge at Granite Creek. Here, very rich gold ore was later discovered and it became the site of National City, a one-time flourishing mining camp. 
This was a period of extreme financial crisis that really amounted to a panic. It was hard to find a job at any kind of work. My brother-in-law, Jim Miner, and I went to Delamar. The first day we rode to Jack Bedouin's place. He was an old settler, very proud of his reckless son, Tom. He had a pair of wild horses in the corral necked together with a strong rope and asked us if we would drive him to the Oihi River, saying that it would be no bother, they would go along the road without trouble. When he turned them out of the corral the next morning, they started direct for Grassy Mountain. Jim started after him after a ride of 10 miles or more and turned them towards the ford, but they broke again and swam the river. We followed, turned them, and they swam back. Even tied together by the necks as they were, they kept us on the run. It was late afternoon when we got them into the corral at the station. When we got to Delamar, we found a crowd of unemployed men, but asked for a job only to learn that there would be no chance of work in the near future. So we started for home. First that night, we stopped at Billy Beers, who lived on a big ranch with a big family and a big lot of cattle. And everything was big about Billy Beers. He was a big, hearty fellow himself, and he liked big meals. When we sat down at the table, the steak platter was not as heavily loaded as he thought it ought to be, and he said with a gentle good nature, Mama, can't we have some steak? God damn it, can't we have some steak? Here we got a thousand head of goddamn steer and a uh, man to cut them up anytime you want it, and we can't get a goddamn steak? God damn it, Mama, now can't we have some steak? <laughs> During these days of stress and privation, my father-in-law received official notice from the government that the land upon which we had homestead was to be reserved for the Indians. This did not affect my brother-in-law, Jim, who had taken up his homestead on the Hay Reservation, but it was a fearful blow to the old man and to me. It seemed as if a black curtain had been pulled down on the future. There was no ray of hope. I broke out in a spirit of desperation and said that we should not starve as long as I had the old Springfield rifle and there were cattle on the range. Shortly afterward, I moved my wife and baby to Winnemucca. There was nothing left. No compensation for the work I had put into the homestead, for the house I had built, the fences I had run, and the trees I had set out. My money was all used up. There was no chance of getting a job around that part of Nevada, so I started for Angel's Camp in California, beat my way to Auburn, only to learn that there had been a fire in the camp, and a lot of men were out of work there, too. I met a contingent of Coxey's army heading east, caught up with them in Reno, Nevada. With another fellow, I made a trip through the Truckee snowsheds in a boxcar. It was so cold that the frost hung in festoons inside the car from the top and sides. We had to keep walking up and down the car to keep from freezing to death. From Reno, I went with the crowd of the army to Wadsworth. Some of them told me they were gonna to go to Washington DC to demand work, but there were other armies of jobless men going from the South and East for the same purpose. One said that, quote, General Coxey was gonna ask Congress to pass a law to build roads. Another said something about non-interest bearing bonds. But it seemed to me they were all going to Washington as a living petition to demand work, where the work should be started by the government for the unemployed. It was one of the greatest unemployed demonstrations that ever took place in the United States, although but few in numbers finally reached Washington. The various armies crossed the country in freight trains, sometimes forcing the railroad companies to furnish transportation, and the mayors of the towns where they appeared in numbers were compelled to provide them with the necessary food in order to get rid of them and send them on their way. At Wadsworth, I met a railroad man who I had known before. He invited me to his house for dinner, and that afternoon we went down the river on a fishing trip. He caught a trout, one of such trout as are to be found only in the Truckee River. We had it for supper. That night I hustled around and found that there was a train load of cattle to be shipped to Chicago, and I got a job going with them. There were four or five other men. It was our job when the train stopped to get out with the prod poles and jab the prod into any steer that happened to be lying down. This was to keep them from being trampled to death or smothered by the other steers. I dropped off at Winnemucca and went home more depressed than I had ever been in my life. I could not understand the problem of unemployment, <clears throat> nor could I find the reason for thousands of men crossing the continent to go to Washington. My thoughts went back more and more to the talks I had had with old Pat Reynolds. These panics in which the workers were the chief sufferers were the outgrowths of the capitalist system, but the cure or preventative did not then occur to me. I struggled along in mental darkness. Suddenly came a great rift of light. This was the strike of railroad men in 1894. Freight trains loaded with perishable fruit for the Eastern markets were sidetracked. Also train loads of coal and other products going West. The strike of the American Railway Union was spreading. The governors of several states had called out the militia. At Sacramento, California, in response to an order in, uh, to fire, the militiamen jabbed their bayonets into the ground and refused to shoot. The militia of Winnemucca refused to answer the call to mobilize. Most of them were railroad men to whom the militia was a social affair. They did not feel inclined to shoulder arms to protect the railroad company's property. The town was flooded with oranges and other produce from the sidetracked cars, but it was better to eat them than to let them rot. 
Coal would be needed for the winter and the boys were not gonna kill each other for laying in a supply for cold weather. The members of ARU were aroused against the railroad interests. The federal soldiers had been sent to Chicago by President Cleveland against the workers who were striking at the Pullman car shops. Eugene Debs had been arrested with others charged with conspiracy to murder. And when this charge was dropped, they were sent to prison for contempt of court. The membership of the organization was indignant at the flagrant injustice. I listened to and took part in many hot discussions. Here I felt was a great power. It was not the fact that produce had been removed from the cars and the strikers were that much ahead. The big thing was that they could stop the trains. It was a lesson of the Knights of Labor, an echo of the voice of the Chicago martyrs. My little girl was taken sick with typhoid pneumonia and I sat at her bedside for days and nights at a stretch. When the crisis of her illness came and she began to recover, I did not think that I was going to be able to sleep. I walked the house through, I walked the town, I went home and darkened the room and drank whiskey. When I finally went to sleep, I slept 24 hours without waking. My wife, then able to be up and around, went out one afternoon and returned to find that the house had been robbed. Several of our little keepsakes had been stolen. This outraged our feelings more than the loss injured us because in the mining camps and on the ranches, it had never been necessary to turn the key in the lock. We would leave home, even for days, and hang the key on the doorpost. If a stranger came by, he might go in and feed himself or sleep in the house, clean up after, and go on his way after hanging the key up in his place. No one ever stole. Contrary to the slanders against them, the Indians never stole even from the deserted mining camps, where ownerless pots and pans and tables were left behind. I once left the house at the Ohio mine for months. When I returned, the door was open, but the guns and blankets, so valuable to the Indians, had not been touched. Gold was found at a place called Kennedy, and a mining excitement broke out. I went there and fixed up a cabin with Al Richardson, got a job with the Imperial Mining Company. I remember going to bed one night and waking the next morning to find that four horses had been put up along the road, four houses had been put up along the road overnight. Later, we took a contract to run a tunnel 100 feet. We were to sharpen our own tools, wheel our own dirt and furnish our own powder. When we examined the face of the old tunnel, which we were to continue, we found that some novice had worked there and the face of the tunnel was scooped out in the center like the bottom of a pot. It was porphyry and would break big if we put our holes in right. So we agreed that at $8 a foot, we could make good wages, put the sum in as our bid and got the contract. Jerry the bum adopted me and Kennedy. Jerry was a rough haired Sky Terrier. When he came to live in my cabin, I made him as comfortable as I could and he followed close to my heels wherever I went. The men about town said, you think you've got a dog, don't you? He won't stay with you. That's Jerry the bum. But Jerry seemed to like me as well as I liked him. I missed him one day when I was downtown at the post office. On my way home, I saw him sitting on the seat of a freight wagon. I said, hello, Jerry, what you doing up there? He didn't seem to hear me. Coming up closer, I said, come on, let's go home. Jerry turned his head away. Well, I said, if that's the way you feel about it so long. Jerry was gone a couple of weeks when I heard a scratching on the door. I opened it and he came and wagging his stub of a tail just as though nothing had happened. I gave him something to eat and he appropriated his old corner. He never left me again as long as I stayed in Kennedy. Jerry had the wanderlust. He would ride around with the freighters wherever they might happen to go when the fit came over him to Winnemucca, Seven Troughs, Sulphur Mines, and lots of other places. Downtown one night in Tom Powell's saloon, Tom said to me, I think you could make some money if we'd start a poker game. Without hesitating, I opened the game and ran it every night, working during the daytime. I laid up about $800 that month. The camp shut down and was deserted even more rapidly than it had sprung up. I went back to Winnemucca and lost most of the money that I had with me at the Faro. Fortunately, I had sent my wife a good part of my winnings from Kennedy before this. In Winnemucca, I worked for a short time driving a team. Leaving my family there, I went to Washburn to run the boundary lines on a farm that my father-in-law had homesteaded there. We hauled my little house from the place of which I had been dispossessed and set it up as an addition to the house that we had built on his new homestead. Some men came along who were going to Silver City, Idaho for a race meet. I asked them to carry along my blankets as I had also decided to go to Silver City. I expected to get there ahead of them as they had to go slowly to keep their horses in trim. Looking down the valley over the enchanting sagebrush flats in the mountains where I had spent so much of my life and where I had expected to live, I left Nevada. I did not return until many years later. And that is the end of chapter four. Uh, a little bit of a <laughs> cowboy western vibe. Um, it's interesting uh, hearing Haywood describe uh, places that I know, you know, having grown up in California, 
um, and spent a lot of time in Northern California um, and the way that they were in the 1890s, you know, more than a century, uh, more than 130 years ago at this point. Um, and, you know, his perspective, I, I think it's really interesting, you know, somebody who's writing uh, about events in the 1890s. Um, he says over and over and over again, he goes out of his way in the narrative to, to say positive things about Native Americans, which you, having read a lot of books from this time period, you almost never hear, um, you know, even when he gets dispossessed um, because the land that he's homesteaded, they the government decides to turn it into a reservation. He doesn't blame the uh, Indians the way a lot of people would have, a lot of contemporary white people would have, I should specify. Um, I think that's remarkable. Um, of course, you know, he's writing this at the end of his life, so he's looking back on it. And uh, so he's writing it as a much more politically conscious person, remembering being a much less politically uh, aware person is his reference to moving along in mental darkness, I thought was striking, but yeah. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed the chapter. Uh, come on back next time, and we will be reading chapter four, Silver City. In the meantime, please like and subscribe. I'll be reading the rest of this book uh, and many, many others off my bookshelf there for it on this channel um, over time. So I hope you've enjoyed.